Good afternoon, and welcome to our panel discussion on the fight for gender affirming healthcare. My name is Ariel Zim Ross, and I'm a correspondent and podcast host at Vice News. I'm also the host of a YouTube show called Queer Sports, also for Vice, and I'm your moderator today. Right now, trans rights are under attack by lawmakers and others who are seeking to restrict an array of day to day activities, from bathroom use to pronoun use to sports participation and healthcare. Today, we will look at the current state of gender affirming healthcare and the impact of those restrictions, particularly on youth. We will also look at what can be done to protect access to safe, effective, and medically necessary care. Joining me today are Arlie Christian, campaign strategist at the ACLU, President Andrea Jenkins, uh, the president of the Minneapolis City Council and the first black openly trans woman to be elected to office in the US. She will be joining us a little bit later uh, she had a scheduling conflict, so uh, maybe in like 20 minutes you'll be able to hear from her. Dr. Angela Cade Gepford, Medical Director of Children's Minnesota Gender Health Program, and Alana Redfield, Federal Policy Director at the Williams Institute, UCLA School of Law. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, before we get started, I have a note for our audience. Our discussion will cover mental health needs, including suicide risk. So if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please call the National Crisis Lifeline at 988. Um, the first question that I have is pretty straightforward, but it, it's important for us to actually cover this, which is uh, what exactly is gender affirming care? What falls under the umbrella of this care? Dr. Gifford? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, so it's a great place to start. At its simplest, gender affirming care is developmentally appropriate care that's about understanding a young person's gender experience. So when someone goes to a gender health program, what they're looking for is a supportive place where young people and their parents can ask questions of medical and mental health professionals who specialize in this care. It is important to understand that it's rooted in science and decades of research. It's also important to understand that it's really individualized. So it's unique for each person that comes in. Often it involves no medical treatment at all. So a lot of it is um, supporting where a young person and their family are at. There are non-medical interventions like shapewear or voice therapy or helping to affirm someone's physical appearance with uh, haircuts and clothing, um, affirming someone's name and pronouns, helping make legal changes or helping with school systems. And then in certain cases, it can involve medications. For young people, those medications are often reversible, either in suppressing puberty or starting an early phase of a masculinizing or feminizing process, and it almost never involves surgical care. Right. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd, now like to ask, I, I'd now like to ask each of you to share in a sentence or two, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about gender affirming care, right? Maybe, I don't know, who, who would like to start us off? Maybe Arlie? Absolutely. It's a great question. And, you know, there's so many misconceptions about gender affirming care, but I'll start off with um, a sort of more fun one. One common misconception about gender affirming care is that it's anyone's business except the patient, right? And their families and their providers that are working with them. And I think this is kind of a commonly understood practice for most types of healthcare that um, you work with your medical professionals to um, understand your options and the risks involved and the benefits involved. And you talk to your families and you discover that you, you, you figure out the best path forward. Often deeply personal decisions about your own care, um, but that seems to be a misconception that gender with gender affirming care that um, politicians get to weigh in on what kinds of treatment we are receiving. Alana, do you want to jump in? Sure. So another um, misconception I think is really important is this idea that gender affirming care is special care. Um, but actually, when we're talking about gender affirming care, we're so often talking about treatments that are uh, available to a broad range of people um, and are just actually we're talking about specifically them being denied to transgender people. Right, right. Um, Dr. Gifford? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are so many, but probably from my perspective as a pediatrician, one of the biggest misconceptions is that parents are somehow not involved in this care. And the reality is that as a pediatrician, I can't provide any care 
to any child for any reason without a parental consent of some kind. And that is includes gender affirming care. So parents are absolutely involved in the care. They're often driving the care and really the ones interested in asking a lot of questions and um, learning more information. So that's probably um, a misconception I'd really like to uh, set the record straight on. I know that I'm not you know, a panelist here, but from my experience, one of the misconceptions that I've seen most is that uh, therapy isn't involved in the process. And I'm kind of wondering if, if, you know, any one of you would like to jump in and just, just talk about that a little bit. Sure. I think that goes along with another misconception, which is that somehow the care is fast or it's right. easy to access, or you walk into a doctor's office and walk away with a prescription for hormones. And that's just not how gender affirming care works, particularly when we're talking about young people. So the standards of care do involve a mental health professional of some kind who's helping work on a discernment process, helping work on capacity for decision-making, helping work on all of those things alongside a young person and their family. And the process of deciding on any treatment um, for a young person would happen over months to years. So this is not a quick, fast process of any kind. Yeah, I mean, just to, to give, you know, the people who are listening to this an idea, like I'm getting top surgery in August. I had to provide in my initial assessment may, very many months ago, a letter from a therapist that I had been seeing for at least a year, um, you know, and that's, so now we're like on a two year process getting me up to August, right? And, and I am an adult. Um, so to assume that that would be any different or any easier for a child under the age of 18 sounds, it, it's just very interesting that that's where people's minds are going. Um, I'm sorry. I want to no, add go ahead. Thought, which is that science overwhelmingly supports access to gender affirming care. And so in addition to these rigorous standards that Dr. Gepford described, they've been um, studied for decades and decades that a lot have, of thought and research and test everything has gone into developing these standards of care to make sure that they are effective um, and uh, keep everyone's best interests in mind. All right. Alana, I'm glad that you jumped in because uh, you co-authored a report at the Williams Institute that estimated that almost 150,000 trans youth in 30 states have lost access to gender affirming care or are at risk of losing it due to pending legislation. Can you bring us up to speed? What's the latest on the state level bans? Sure. So um, thank you for the question, Ariel. And, and the 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 report came out at the beginning of the legislative session. And so now we know much more about what, what the landscape looks like. Yeah. So we have uh, 20 states now which have enacted bans on gender affirming care for minors. And um, Louisiana has um, is sort of in a place where it will likely pass a ban, although we, had, we haven't seen it pass yet. Um, there's also a few more states um, that are considering uh, bans still at this late stage of the game. The state legislature sessions tend to run um, sort of like January to June, although there's some variation. Uh, but we estimate now, uh, if you include Louisiana, that around 98,000 trans youth live in states where the care that they need is um, is being uh, curtailed or someone is attempting to, to, to ban that care. Um, and that would apply in most cases to all the care that Dr. Gepford described um, although there's some variations, right? Um, so, you know, there are some laws that would allow puberty blockers, but would ban um, other types of hormone treatments. And there, um, at least one state bans only surgery, but allows other treatments. Um, but nonetheless, they are all, there are a tremendous number of states that are targeting the care in some form. Um, and, and that's also uh, on top of a number of states that ban coverage for gender affirming care under Medicaid plans or state insurance plans. Um, so there are around 11 states that do that in some form. Uh, and actually, let me roll that back. There are 10 states because Florida, we recently just got a decision we'll talk about today, I hope, that um, overturned Florida's ban on gender affirming care under Medicaid. So that's very exciting. I mean, uh, if you want to talk about it now, by all means. Well, sure, sure. And I'm sure all of us have uh, feelings about it. Um, but the decision was issued in, in a case called Decker uh, versus Wida, And it's um, around access to care for both minors and adults under Florida's Medicaid plan. And it really is a broad decision that pulls in excellent science and just looks at um, what they're trying to do with uh, with the ban in Florida under there's a couple different 
bans in Florida, but um, it basically says that these bans are based on flawed science and they're not consistent with the best practices for, for treating uh, transgender young people. Um, and so we're seeing that as one of actually many cases lately that have really started to, to um, to push back on these bans that are being passed in many states. And I would just note that um, we've seen several different states where there are cases. In Arkansas, there was a decision the other day, and we've seen um, some good decisions even in Alabama and uh, in other cases. So there is actually sort of a, a bit of a trend of cases um, that are pushing back on the bans, which is mm -hmm. why we can't say for sure that access to these to care in these states is going to be completely limited, because hopefully uh, the uh, colleagues like we have here today and others will be able to um, successfully beat them. Right. That said, in the meantime, there are kids who and families who are severely disrupted, who are scared, who are anxious, who are trying to look at other options or even relocate. Um, and I, I want to keep those people, you know, at, at the forefront today. And so we're actually going to hear from some of these individuals, uh, you know, courtesy of Vice News, my employer, uh, we show interviews from 2021 with two families who were living in Arkansas when the state became the first state to ban gender affirming care. Um, this past Tuesday, a federal judge issued a permanent injunction against that law. But this clip does a really good job of explaining to us the turmoil that these families go through when these laws are first enacted or, or even brought up in, in, you know, just generally, right? When, when, when they know that this might happen. Um, so if you could please roll the clip. When Zara was eight years old, she started taking hormone blockers, which paused her male puberty from progressing. Uh, Zara Renee. Should I get one oh, okay. <laughs> She's now having to consider her reality without them. What would it feel like for you if you weren't able to get access to your treatment anymore? Before then, I was very depressed and suicidal. If my treatment had stopped, then that would just uh, happen. Not just with me, but like if you saw this with anyone that had their treatment stopped, like you would probably see like a lot of depression, a lot of suicidal thoughts in them. It's really hard to not get what you need when it's one, the one of the things you need the most. My posters and stuff are in the car still, so. While some families are moving out of state to access treatment, many parents can't afford to. Brandi Evans is struggling to find a safe, affordable option for her son, Drew. I hope one day there is a final rally, like we don't have to do this anymore, but that's not gonna happen in my lifetime, I don't think. No, probably won't happen in mine. Before he received hormone therapy, Drew was suicidal. After, Brandy says, the weight of his severe depression lifted. I'd say like a month to two months in, I started seeing that kid come back, come out of his shell, talk to us more, laugh. What did that feel like as a mom? It was like, that's it. This has, this has been the answer all along. Why would anybody want to take that away from them? Why? And take that right away as a parent. In that clip, um, Zara and Brandy both spoke really beautifully and very clearly about how important access to gender affirming care really is. Um, Dr. Gefford, can you put their comments in a broader context for us? Yeah, I think the first thing that they really outline is what Alana alluded to earlier, which is we would not provide gender affirming care for those under 18 if we didn't have decades of research dozens of research studies on tens of thousands of young people showing that it improves outcomes. So we provide gender affirming care because it helps, because it works, because kids do better. So things like reduction in depression, reduction in suicidality, better overall sense of well-being, better self-esteem. These are the measurable outcomes that we see. So that's why we provide the care. And without the care, and particularly Think of a family who has gone through months and years to access care, and now it's being pulled away. Think of the negative mental health impact on those kids and on those families. So the American Academy of Pediatrics actually declared that we have a mental health crisis right now for young people in this country. We know that we have an intervention that can improve the mental health of a really marginalized group of young people 
and we're banning access to it. So we're taking away something that we know works at a time when kids need it most. Often um, when I hear doctors say, you know, this saves lives, um, the counter argument often has to do with side effects of some of these treatments. Mm -hmm. And uh, listen, I think, I think that saving lives and, and some side effects, I, th I think for some people that, that is very clear. But if you could just take a moment to just really explain what we're talking about here. Sure. You know, as I mentioned, Nat, a, a lot of gender affirming care doesn't involve any medical treatment at all. So I think that that is without side effects. Um, when it comes to young people, often we're talking about reversible medications like puberty suppressing medications. Those have been well studied for decades in both cisgender and transgender kids. And we know very well how to protect the health of kids who are taking those medications. Um, and then when we talk about gender affirming hormones, there are some reversible and some not reversible changes that happen with those. And as with any medication, there could be potential side effects. This is why it's very important that care like this happen within the context of specialists who know how to provide care for kids. So who can help adolescents take medication safely, monitor for side effects, come in regularly for checkups. I don't want this care happening outside of that context. And I don't want it happening on the internet where young people are going to access medications if it's not legally available. We want this care safe and we want this care happening with teams who know how to best support young people and their families. Right. I, I'm glad you made that point. And I think few people make that in point enough. Uh, I think, you know, I actually have a lot of pride in the fact that I think that trans people are like the OG biohackers. But the side effect of that is, you know, stuff happening outside of, of regulation. And, and that can be risky, a lot riskier than, than what is happening now, which is in fact saving lives. So I think it's worth, uh, I definitely think it's worth mentioning that. Arlie, I want to turn to you for a second here because uh, the ACLU recently successfully challenged the Arkansas law highlighted in, in the clip that we just watched. And uh, the ACLU is also in court in other states. Can you tell us what legal arguments you're making and, and how judges are responding? Absolutely. Um, let's, let's dig into the cases a little bit. Um, but first, you know, just Backing up a second, Ariel, I think you mentioned that the first, you know, Arkansas was the first state to pass this ban on gender affirming care for youth. That was in 2021. So we're talking about in the span of two-ish, two plus years that we've gotten up to, as, as Alana mentioned, 20 states with some type of ban on care for trans youth. So I will say, you know, we've been under a wildfire of attacks recently. Um, and you're like, Arlie, why did this happen? Did some new study come out? Are there new information about this care? Absolutely not, right? This wildfire of attacks is just based on political leaning. So this is extremist politicians who have picked up the issue of um, trans youth as the issue du jour that they can... Um, gain votes on essentially. Um, and it's really um, it's really quite terrible to think about using youth in this way as a political wedge issue. Um, but but here we are. So um, you know ACLU is currently in eight of those states fighting in the courts with bans. Um, although I guess seven now because we did have this amazing victory um, in Arkansas. Um, so digging in a little bit to the, the legal cases. And there are other challenges as well that other organizations are bringing um, on these terrible um, healthcare bans. And there's a few different arguments that um, people are making in court depending on the nature of the ban. Um, but essentially we're saying these laws that are blocking access to a particular type of care for a particular population are unconstitutional. Um, these violate the Equal Protection Clause. These violate the Due Process Clause. And as, as Alana talked about, it, it's really about, this is about specifically about discrimination against trans people, right? So these laws are banning treatments for the purpose of gender transition, treatments that trans people as a population may get, but these treatments are allowed when they're for non-trans people, right? right. Um, cisgender people uh, receive um, you know, the, the types of care we're talking about all the time. So that's the definition of discrimination, right? Um, uh, under, you know, that is not equal protection under our laws. 
Um, we also, interestingly, there are quite a few um, free speech violations that come up in these um, cases. You know, we're talking about laws that tell doctors, medical professionals that are obligated to um, provide best practice care, that they're not allowed to provide a certain type of care. And often they say that you're not allowed to even refer your patients to go get this care. That's a free speech violation. It's a violation of the rights of doctors, patients, and families to discuss the medical information that they need to determine the best course of treatment. Um, so, you know, looking on the opposite side of these cases is the states that are trying to defend um, these bans. Remember, these politicians in the last few years created these bans with little to no, really no medical evidence or information. Now their state lawyers are trying to defend them and they've really got nothing to work with, right? So when we look at a lot of these legal cases, um, they're trying to say that the care was experimental. These states are trying to say that care is carelessly prescribed, but they have no evidence to back up these claims, right? Um, right? So when we take away sort of the fear mongering, the politics that was going on, we bring all the evidence to court and judges are looking at these bans and they are saying, this is based on misinformation. The truth is very clear when it's laid out in the courtroom that this care is safe, it's studied, um, and it is absolutely benefiting um, these patients. And taking that, the state taking that away will harm, cause real harm to real patients and families. So I will say, you know, it's given me a ton of comfort just to see judges in various places issue these injunctions, preliminary injunctions, and now you know, permanent injunctions on these laws saying, this is not based on fact. Um, it's really um, you know, brought a lot, of, a, a lot of comfort, even though we're, we're definitely not out of the woods yet. Yeah, I, it's kind of nice to see the science actually get listened to in this case, uh, which you know, wasn't the case with abortion. Um, so it's, it's kind of refreshing and again, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but um, for now, that is nice. Dr. Gifford, I, just before we move on, I just want to ask you, you know, one of the things that Arlie mentioned was that a lot of these medicines are currently used by cis people. And I think that that's something else that, that people don't quite understand. Can you kind of explain in what way, what are we talking about here? Sure. So if you take a medication like puberty suppression, so there are some children who go through puberty too early and it's harmful to your body to go through puberty too early. So we use the exact same medications to reversibly pause their puberty until they're of an age to go through puberty like their peers would. And so we have been using puberty suppressing medications in kids who are not transgender um, for 30 to 40 years, have very good studied data on it. And in fact, it is the most common reason to use puberty suppressing medication. So much more common than its use in transgender uh, young people. Similarly with medications like estrogen or testosterone, those are also used in cisgender folks. Um, either if you have uh, something called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, you may take uh, estrogen as a cisgender woman to uh, help with your uh, estrogen levels. If you are someone whose um, brain doesn't produce adequate levels of testosterone. So you have a condition called hypogonadism. You may receive testosterone treatment to augment that. So these medications, again, are used for uh, gender affirmation of people who are not transgender. And so it is absolutely discriminatory to say that they can't be used in a population of people simply based on their identity. And I think that came through um, really, really clearly in the in the judge's decision, uh, particularly in the Arkansas case. And that, and that was really reassuring it you know it also really violates the the rights of parents and that came through in the decision too you know that parents are have a right to access medical care for their children and make medical decisions for their children and that was really taken away in this case and the, and the judge certainly highlighted that as well right i mean that's that's exactly what we're about to talk about right these, these bills are often framed as protecting kids and supporting parental rights when in fact you know, the parents are supporting their kids and, and taking care of them, taking good care of them by having them, you know, see these medical professionals. So how can we amplify the real story here? Um, how about, Arlie, do you, do you want to take this one? You know, what's, what's effective messaging? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I will say, you know, when you talk about that framing um, of uh, protecting kids and supporting parental rights, you know, when we look at um, state legislatures across the country who have been pushing these bills, um, we, you know, we'll have lawmakers say we want, you know, we believe in parental rights and protecting kids. And then they have parents in front of them, parents from across their state with young trans kids saying, please, please do not take away access to health care for my child um, and pleading. And, you know, those parents don't seem to be top of mind for um, these lawmakers. Um, and as doc Dr. Gifford kind of talked about, there's a, a long medical process of um, being able to access care safely. There's also, you know, the trail before that is such a long personal process of families coming to terms with um, their child's gender identity and figuring that out together. And there's often years of parents um, getting to know their child and learning about what it means to be trans and, and the child learning about their gender identity. So um, these issues are not, you know, it's, it's not a child says one day, um, you know, I'm trans and they're parent takes them to a doctor and, and they're on hormones the next day. That's not how this works. Um, so to look those parents in the eye and say, I don't care. I don't believe you. I don't under, you know, know anything about what you're going through. I'm going to tell you what to do is really painful. Um, but so, you know, when we talk about these issues in the, in the legislature or anywhere else, um, it's really helpful, especially for people who don't know a lot about um, trans issues and trans youth just to start with those shared values, right? Everyone deserves the freedom to enjoy happy and fulfilling lives. Everyone has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. Everyone has the right to access the care they need to lead rich and full lives. That really helps people understand it from their own perspective um, that this is not a they issue, it's a me issue. This is about all of us. Um, and we can talk about all of us and say, Nobody wants this government overreach. Nobody wants extremist politicians inserting themselves into our decisions and trying to control the most personal decisions of our lives, right? And if that sounds like familiar messaging, right? It's very similar, Ariel, as you said, to the fight for um, the right to abortion and our reproductive rights. Um, these, you know, the fight for abortion access and access to gender affirming care are very similar and they're linked by this very simple belief each of us are the rightful authors of our own life story. Each of us are best positioned to make decisions about our bodies and ourselves and what we need to survive and thrive. So hopefully that kind of messaging can start to get through to people and help people relate to this issue and, and understand this is not just about trans people. It's not just about trans kids. It's about every single person being able to be the authors of our own life stories. Right. And it's probably worth pointing out as well that the many of the same organizations that are involved in this fight to ban gender affirming care for youth were actually the architects of the ban on abortion as well. Right. We're talking about uh, organizations like Alliance Defending Freedom. Right. So this is these things are actually not just linked in in terms of uh, philosophy or thinking, but but actually linked in terms of the groups pushing these things, these uh, right wing conservative Christian organizations that represent a minority of, of how, you know, the U.S. actually feels about this stuff. Yeah, and one, um, one I might just add quick, you know, along the lines of sort of protecting kids, the, the, the judge in the Arkansas case made it very clear that, you know, evidence shows that prohibiting access to medical care actually harms kids. And so we're not protecting them by restricting it. But also these are often the same groups that are trying to ban kids from participating in sports or restrict their access to bathrooms and locker rooms in schools, both of which cause a ton of distress for trans and gender diverse kids. So if we really wanted to protect kids, we would make sure that their schools are safe. We would make sure that they can go to the bathroom at school. We would make sure that they could participate in sports with their peers, um, but that's not what's happening. And so it's a, it's a ruse to say that this is anything about protecting um, children because we know what keeps kids safe and we know what helps them thrive and that's what we need to be doing. So Dr. Yeah. Gifford, what is the, the right messaging for this, right, to, to kind of change that narrative? I think what we started with, that we know that young people are experiencing a lot of distress when it comes to their mental health, that 
we know that trans and gender diverse young people experience high rates of harassment and stigma and discrimination and therefore have um, consequences as a result of that. And we know that gender affirming care protects them from that, that when they are seen and heard and believed for who they are, when they are able to talk with mental health and medical specialists who can support them, they do better. So protecting them is about helping them access care, making their schools safe, making them feel included and making them feel like they belong. Um, we are now joined by Andrea Jenkins, the president of the, of the Minneapolis City Council and the first openly trans woman, first openly black trans woman to be elected to office in the US. Uh, president Jenkins, thank you so much for joining us. We're just talking about um, the ways to sort of change the messaging that's out there, right? A lot of these bills are being passed with the messaging that, uh, that people are trying to protect kids and, and they're trying to protect parental rights. Uh, when in mm -hmm. fact, you know, as evidenced by these experts here, that is not the case, right? Quite the opposite. So how do we change that narrative? Uh, what have you found is effective? Right, so um, hello everyone. And I'm thrilled to be here with uh, my esteemed colleagues. Um, I was just at a press conference um, celebrating the opening of Pride here in Minneapolis and certainly talking about some of the very same issues that uh, are being discussed here. I think really um, a, a critical point, and it's already been made, is that we have to continuously make the point that this is not just about trans rights. This is about bodily autonomy and democracy and who has access and control over their own bodies um, has been stated. And I've been saying this from the beginning of the takedown of Roe v. Wade. And, and I've always stated that Planned Parenthood, reproductive rights organization is where many trans people go and seek health care generally. And so it has always been a intersectional issue, but even more so now as we recognize that these attempts to um, legislate uh, women's bodies, people who can get pregnant um, is very much the same as the attack on trans and gender nonconforming uh, people. Uh, I just was a part of a study uh, that is coming out in a couple of weeks around lesbian women. And one of the most interesting aspects of the study is that lesbian and women, them identified people are really thinking about how their gender is fluid and not stable, um, not definable. And I think that is what the trans movement and trans liberation movement has brought to this whole conversation of gender and sexuality. Um, and so I think the best anecdote is to really see and lift up the intersections um, the struggle for trans liberation, as well as the struggle for, lip, for reproductive rights. And when we can really conjoin those two issues, um, I think we can start to see more, uh, more victories. You know, the, the outpouring of electoral support after the turn, overturning of Roe v. Wade um, was really palpable. And we elected a Democratic president here in Minnesota. We elected a, what we call a um, triumphant. Um, and, you know, we have control of the governor's office, the, the state legislator, the Senate, and the House. And so we're able to really pass some um, really I think effective legislation, legislation that protects trans kids, that creates opportunities for people to come to this state and seek reproductive 
uh, health care as well as trans uh, affirming health care. And I hope that we can see the intersections of these issues coming together and those advocates, those activists can join forces and really make this movement uh, stronger. And at the bottom line, it's about democracy. It's about people having access and uh, agency over their own future. Yeah. I'm really glad you, you know, brought up the, the fact that trans liberation frees everyone, right? It'll free yeah. cis men from the chains of what they believe masculinity to be. Um, and so that's, that's, that's nothing but positive, right? Um, yeah, that's what Elliot Page talks about in his new book. Um, yeah. You know, really freeing up this toxic male, um, toxic masculinity that is really um, crushing our entire society. Um, and I think freeing up males to be more comfortable in their bodies, more comfortable in their expressions is going to lead to a, a safer, um, more productive society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I will admit that I'm still halfway through that book, so I'm, I'm still working on it. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so while many of these bills are focused on youth, some states have also moved to restricting gender-affirming care for adults. Alana, could you give us a quick overview of that threat and what that looks like, where that's happening, what we can expect? Sure. So I, I think the um, sad reality that most of us are probably aware of is that these attacks on youth um, often lead to attacks on adults and that this is really a step in a larger, larger process of trying to come for uh, other protections that allow trans people to thrive. Um, so uh, while we don't have a outright ban on gender affirming care for adults yet, we do have a lot of states that are making um, attempts to do so. So, um, you know, there's a couple of different ways that they might approach this. For example, as we talked about earlier, there may be a ban on insurance coverage, which makes gender affirming care inaccessible for a lot of people. If they don't have the Medicaid won't cover it or insurance plans won't cover it. Um, and then, of course, if insurance plans are not covering care, then that also means providers can't thrive that are in the area, and so people have to travel further to get care. Um, so those are, that's one way. And then there are several places where state legislatures have attempted to really come for uh, trans care in different ways um, through the law. So Florida SB 254 uh, recently passed, um, which is one of the laws that's at issue in these recent right, positive cases in Florida. Um, that case, that, that that law actually creates restrictions on how people can access care. So rather than saying it's banned, it says, if you wanna get the care, you have to do X, Y, and Z thing. And that puts a lot of burden on providers by, by requiring providers to comply with very um, overwhelming amounts of, um, of different uh, administrative requirements. And then also limiting the number of providers who can provide care. So limiting nurse practitioners, for example, to so that's only, um, physicians that can prescribe care. So that's one way to do it is to really restrict who can pres prescribe care and also to make it harder for doctors to prescribe care. Um, another way that we've seen that happening is through um, through making doctors liable for extended periods of time if anything were to, if a person were to report that they had a negative uh, side effect or, or reaction or response to gender affirming care of any kind. So creating um, increased liability for providers makes them more financially and personally liable if things happen uh, over a long time span. So we're seeing that approach in Arkansas and seeing that approach in other places too. So it's another way of kind of like getting another bite at this apple of banning care. Um, and it does affect adults as well as young people. So, so we, we see these different kinds of approaches and, and this was also um, what happened in Missouri that the attorney general tried to promote regulations there that would um, have put restrictions on adult care. Um, and I think we can also um, expect that there will be continued restrictions um, and continued uh, efforts in this direction, ultimately leading in, uh, into a outright bans on gender affirming care for adults, um, depending on what happens, of course, with the courts and with Congress, et cetera. Right. Uh, speaking of Congress, we're also seeing attempts to restrict gender affirming care at the federal level. Um, one bill under consideration, for example, would deny federal funding for pediatric medical residents 
uh, to any children's hospital that provides gender affirming care. Alana, can you explain what that means exactly? Yeah, so uh, I actually really resonated with me earlier when Dr. Gepfer talked about the importance of having providers who know what they're doing and have support and expertise to provide this kind of care to young people. And, and one um, type of facility where people access that care is children's hospitals. Um, so uh, some uh, conservative members of Congress put forward a bill that would have, uh, this. there's a bill every year or every periodically that reauthorizes funding for children's hospitals for education programs. So these programs are used to, uh, to train up to 60% of, of, of pediatric specialists. And uh, so a lot of doctors um, learn or practice or, or come into um, their, their profession through these programs. And uh, the bill uh, is often reauthorized without incident by in, a, in a bipartisan way. But this year, um, Representative Crenshaw from Texas inserted a provision that would um, make it contingent that that no that no hospital that provides gender affirming care for young people could receive children's hospital funding in this in this program. So it's really uh, it's really one uh, way in which. Uh, these kinds of pro prohibitions are being inserted in places where it would otherwise be a bipartisan bill. And another example is through the budget. So um, the Hyde Amendment, right, famously uh, bans federal funding for abortion under most circumstances. And that was passed, um, you know, shortly after Roe versus Wade. And, uh, and it was passed uh, through a budget process. So every year as Congress is looking to fund things, um, we uh, can we have to pay attention right now as there are multiple efforts like the one I just described to include bans on gender affirming care as well. Right. Um, I wanna go back to care for adults and, and trying to ban that. But before that, Dr. Gepford, do you have anything you wanna add? Yeah, so uh, at Children's Minnesota, I also happen to be our chief education officer and, and the, the clause that Alana was talking about regarding this uh, CHGME funding for medical education, I think what people don't understand is that we can't train at children's hospitals without that any type of pediatrician. So, for example, in Minnesota, Children's Minnesota will end up training 75% or more of the pediatricians who will care for kids in this state. So if Children's Minnesota loses funding for medical education because we also provide gender affirming care, that's going to create an extraordinary shortage of pediatricians who are going to be trained in this state. We already have a national shortage of pediatricians. So the last thing we want to be doing is inserting these clauses that are going to limit all kids' ability to access any type of pediatric care in any state. So I think while trying to hurt and attack trans kids, we're actually going to end up harming care for all kids. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm always making connections in my mind and, and the way that I think about it is also, you know, this is very similar to uh, banning trans women in sports, right? The, the idea of that will also hurt cis women because they will also face increased scrutiny, right? This stuff is not isolated to trans people. And I think that's a really, really, really important thing for people to understand is that an attack on trans people is an attack on everyone ultimately. Um, and, and we're all kind of in this together, whether, whether some people like it or not. Um, but sorry, Arlie, you wanted to add something about uh, these attempts to, to ban care for adults. Yeah, and you know, I think when we look at the sum of, of where these attacks are going, certainly there's um, the legal you know, attacks so far that we've seen on access to care, mostly for youth. And then as Alana described in some, in some instances for adults, um, we also have to look at the chilling effect that all of this has on access to care. So even when there's not, you know, a specific law has not passed in that state or for that particular individual situation, we are seeing across the country an incredible chilling effect on both youth and adults access to care. And that happens by both, you know, individuals and adults in living in a particular state feeling like there are laws that are being passed against the community and that they are not able to access care anymore, moving to other states because of these attacks. Um, and then also we're seeing um, you know, medical providers who, again, there may not be a specific law saying you cannot prescribe that specific thing, but their hospitals and institutions are afraid of the risk, right? So they're saying, shut the programs down. We don't want, we're not going to provide gender affirming care in this institution or the provider themselves, an individual practitioner is saying, you know what, I can't afford this risk. I can't figure out the law. I can't 
um, you know, I can't afford to, to take on this risk. So the, the chilling effect that we're seeing on individual trans people's access to care across the country is, is really um, frightening. I would even add to that, Ariel, that um, medical school students and graduates are looking at states uh, are leaving states where there are bans and moving to uh, other communities, which in the long run is going to limit access to health care broadly in those communities. And so uh, the chilling effect is real, as well as it's stifling health care uh, providers in communities that desperately need them, particularly rural communities where there's already shortages of healthcare providers. But, you know, people don't wanna take that risk. And so they are moving to communities where they feel like they can be uh, able to practice the kinds of medicine that is, is comfortable or legal for them without fear of, losing their license or losing their freedom. Yeah. Uh, President Jenkins, I, I, while we're talking about this, I think it would be helpful for you to maybe discuss a little bit, you know, the opportunities for action, what people can do. And I have a question I want to ask you, but before I do that, um, from what I understand, you're joining us from your car. And I just want to clarify for our audience that you are not driving. You have a silly I am not. On, I am you're not, not currently driving, correct? I am not driving. I am sitting still uh, yes. with the air conditioner on because it's really hot. <laughs> yes, I am not driving. Yeah, no, but I, I'm so, uh, we are so appreciative that you actually were able to join us. And, and, you know, the fact that you were just at a press conference is the reason that you are in your car right now. Um, yes. So thank you so much for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, while I have your attention, uh, President Jenkins, you have been talking on a broad array of issues affecting trans people in Minneapolis. Could you please share what you've been working on, you know, as well as some of the lessons you've learned on how local policymakers can promote health uh, for trans people? Sure. Well, some of the things that I've been working on um, for, no, five years ago, 2018, we passed. Um, a ban on conversion therapy in the city of Minneapolis. And then subsequently the state uh, followed through with that ban uh, earlier this year. Um, we have a transgender equity coordinator at the city of Minneapolis, which is a full-time position that uh, really tries to connect trans and gender non-conforming communities to their local government to have access and entry points into um, policymakers and have an impact on the policies that get passed and created in our communities. Uh, every year we host a transgender equity summit that brings together healthcare providers, mental health care providers. And when we talk about gender affirming health care, I'm sure you guys acknowledge that it is not just physical health care, but it's also mental health care. That is a, a part of that. But we, we bring together all of these um, gender um, affirming organizations, support groups, et cetera, healing opportunities uh, with a strong focus on uh, disability justice, on racial equity, racial justice, um, every year for the past 10 years. And next week, I will be presenting a resolution honoring drag as a, um, as a art form and a protected freedom of speech uh, in this community, and just welcoming drag communities all around the country that are also being banned, that are also a huge part of the queer um, diaspora, if you will. Um, and, you know, I certainly know that it was a, a safe place for me to explore my gender identity. And, um, and so we wanna lift up drag and drag performers as a, 
as a part of our community. And, and it really pains me that in the past few years, I think in our in the trans community, there's been some some sort of separations from drag and trans and gender non-conforming folks. But the reality is that they are a integral part of this community. And so we want to welcome that community into this space and welcome people from all around the country. You know, I think the most important thing that I can say about the work that we have been trying to do is that we have been trying to create a welcoming community for um, trans and gender non-conforming people, for people seeking reproductive health care. Uh, many of those folks are trans and gender non-conforming as well. And so trying to create an environment where those people can thrive. Um, it's been really uh, interesting and I've been uh, in many spaces with Dr. Geffert where we're trying to build the infrastructure for those families that are coming to Minneapolis to seek gender affirming healthcare because they don't have those opportunities here. And so we have uh, folks that are creating financial support. Um, the city is creating a directory of educational opportunities of healthcare, of safe and affirming healthcare providers. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been doing in this community to try to move um, the, the quest for trans liberation forward. I, I don't know if you probably didn't notice my eyebrows were doing a lot while you were talking because I kept I going, wow, notice. there's a trans equity coordinator. I'm sorry, yeah. what? It's a full-time position with full benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's quite incredible, yes. Well, that's I, I want to hear more about that, but, but I think we're limited on time. So uh, maybe I'll hit you up after this. Um, All right. <laughs> this work obviously extends beyond Minneapolis, if you just, as you just mentioned, right? The, the state of Minnesota has actually passed a shield law that makes it a sanctuary for gender affirming care. Dr. Gepford, can you tell us about that law, what it accomplishes and, and also where it falls short? Oh, I think you're muted. This is why they say don't mute yourself. Um, so I think that the, you know, it's a, it's a great law in that it protects uh, the legal right to access gender affirming care <laughs> in the state of Minnesota. Um, both for patients and families, but also for providers. So it gives us some sense of safety that we can um, practice according to guidelines and deliver medical care um, in the best way possible. I think the where it falls short is just that it's not going to be an ultimate solution. So there are so, there are about five states now that have passed shield laws like this, but the problem is that we don't have nationalized health care in the United States. So health care, including health care coverage like insurance and including planning for where people can get care and numbers of providers for a state and things like that is all done on a state by state basis. So if you ban care in Iowa and Minnesota has a shield law protecting that care, sure you can drive from Iowa to Minnesota, but you're going to have to drive multiple times. You're going to have to have financial resources and your insurance is going to have to be able to cross that state line as well, which often they do not. Um, so the other big barrier that we have in place is medical records. So if anyone who has access healthcare knows, all of our medical records are electronic. They are not shared state by state. They are not even shared within a state. And so when you have patients who are bouncing around to different health systems in different states to try to access basic healthcare, the quality of that healthcare, the continuity of that healthcare, evaluations that they may have gone through in one state and now they're going to another, it's just not going to transfer. So we're really um, impacting the overall quality of care, which would happen if we did this for any type of healthcare, not just trans healthcare, um, because of how our healthcare system is set up in this country. Okay, all right. You know, okay, while we're on this subject, there, there was a viewer question that was asked, and I kind of, I feel like this is directly linked to what you're talking about. So one of the viewer questions was, you know, with many families with trans youth being forcibly displaced to other states to continue gender affirming care, what kinds of systems are in place to make transfers of care as seamless as possible? Yeah. 
you just talked about how it's not seamless. Is it's, there anything yeah. in place to counter that? I mean, no. I mean, that's the hard reality. So I think that, you know, what um, President Jenkins was talking about is that our local coalitions here, groups that support families and groups that support LGBTQ Minnesotans are trying to put that in place, but we're building from the ground up because we're designed to support people within our state. We're not designed to necessarily support large, you know, hundreds of kids coming into the state from other states. Um, so they're trying to both support families who may travel here for care, but also move to Minnesota and establish a residency here in Minnesota. And, um, you know, what a hardship for a family to have to uproot their entire uh, family, their community, their jobs to go somewhere to get health care for their child. This also, you know, as you've just alluded to, this, this has a significant impact on your clinic as well, right? So is there anything that you can do to alleviate some of that pressure? Yeah, you know, access to um, gender affirming health care for young people is already hard to come by. Our wait list at Children's Minnesota is over a year long for someone to get in as a new patient. And so when we have hundreds of kids on our wait list already, and now we have hundreds of kids from other states who are going to be coming to Minnesota to get care, um, it takes time to hire new staff and to find spaces to care for kids. And if you've ever worked in healthcare, healthcare does not move quickly. I mean, the COVID pandemic certainly showed us that, you know, it was tough to mobilize an entire healthcare system to respond to a global pandemic. Um, so it's going to take time to build that infrastructure. And, you know, we're all doing the best we can, but the best we could do would be to protect kids where they are and where they live in the places that they call home. All right. On that note, Arlie, as a campaign strategist, do you have any tips for how individuals, you know, just ordinary people might be able to get involved and, and make a difference? Yeah, I mean, this is such an important time for each of us to get involved and make a difference, right? You know, we are just individuals and we we make up we make up this country and we are, our voices on this issue are so important. Um, not just as a kind of desire to do the right thing as we, but like, because this affects all of us, as we talked about, right? This, none of us want the government intruding on our personal lives and decisions. We all want to be free of these gender stereotypes. We don't want to be used as political pawns. Um, and we don't want this type of fear mongering and, and um, attacks to be possible against any of our communities. So, you know, it's about democracy, as President Jen Jenkins um, said. Um, so your voice really makes a difference right now. Um, you know, pay attention to what's going on in your state and across the country. Um, we are facing federal attacks right now, as Alana mentioned, in our appropriations process and in Congress. Um, sign action alerts when they come along. You know, sometimes we, we scroll past these and think, oh, it doesn't apply to us, but get your name on there, contact your representatives, um, follow your local trans-led organizations. They know what's going on, they know what these attacks are, and they will tell you, we need you to make these calls, we need you to send these letters um, and uh, support them financially if you can, otherwise with your time. Um, follow your ACLU affiliates across the country. They are involved in these fights. Um, but also on a more personal level, um, speak up, you know, educate yourself about trans rights. Speak up at the dinner table when you hear something that sounds a little funny and you think your family or friends might need some guidance. Um, post stories on social media, share the words of other trans influencers and thought, thought um, leaders. Um, you know, raise your hand in that meeting or that class when you hear something that um, doesn't sound quite right. Um, there's so many ways that we each can really make a difference amongst our peers and make sure that we are moving our country person by person forward on this issue so that we can get past this difficult moment of attacks and get to a greater and stronger um, America where we're not um, coming down on our trans youth and our trans adults and and all of us um, in, in ways that are not democratic. So um, we hope that you'll keep speaking up. Arlie, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists who joined us today. Uh, your expertise is so incredibly valuable to all of us. And, and I hope that everybody really got something out of this. We weren't able to get to more viewer questions just because of a time limit, 
Um, but I really appreciate everybody who took the time to actually watch the stream, who will be watching this stream later on as well. Um, everybody who showed up today, thank you so much. Uh, and if you missed any part of this event, as I just mentioned, the, the recording will be available on the Harvard Chan School's YouTube channel. Have a great effort. Let me say that again. Have a great afternoon, everybody. <laughs>